I think we are ready to get started. Sorry. Thank you all so much. I'm sorry that in this room, I will maybe have to turn my back. I'll just keep doing this sort of 360. Welcome to um, our next uh, Durham School Distinguished Lecture in our uh, Distinguished Lecturer Series. I'm very pleased to um, introduce Professor Stefano Schiavon, who is a full professor at the University of California, Berkeley, where he has been for most of your academic career, I think, all of your uh, a post postgraduate. So he did his master's and doctorate at the University of Padova in Italy. And then from there to um, Berkeley, where he's now an associate director also of their Center for the Built Environment, which has been doing a lot of amazing work over many decades on um, how the built environment can impact human occupant comfort and productivity. And uh, Professor Skiovan is continuing that good work in their group as the associate director. So we're so very pleased to have you as our next speaker, Professor Skiovan, and he will be talking about the future of cooling. Thank you for allowing us to record this. And I see that you posted in the chat where you people can download the slides as well as um, learn more about your work. If um, people are late joining, I will make sure to repost that for them. So let's give a welcome to Professor Skiovan. Hi, everybody. I'm very happy to be here and be able to chat with you about uh, uh, what many people think should be the future of cooling. I, the slides are available and uh, I share in the chat some way that you can get in contact with me through email or through LinkedIn. And uh, I will share that again later on in case someone join uh, later. Uh, you're welcome to interrupt me and ask questions while I'm presented, and I will also be available after the talk in case you have additional questions. So um, today I'm going to talk about cooling. That is one of the main functions that we need to provide into buildings. And according to the International Energy Agency, the world is facing a cooling crunch. The amount of cooling that we are going to need in the future is going to triple in the next uh, few decades. And uh, today I'm going to talk about the potential solution on how can we achieve that goal without having a very large negative impact on the environment. So why is, uh, and before I start, I want to be sure, can you hear me well? Yes. Uh, yeah. On, so on no Zoom, problem with that. Hear you Perfect. Well. Yes. No, we can hear you. you sound okay. good. So um, why is uh, cooling going to increase so much? Uh, one of the main reasons is that the world population is growing and most of the growth is happening in tropical climate. And uh, right now, uh, you know, place like the United States or like Japan, the market is almost saturated with air conditioner. And so there is no much more growth to happen. Something similar happened in China where a few decades ago, only a small percentage of the population had AC. Right now, around 70% of the population have access to AC. The situation is changing in countries like India, like Indonesia, like Brazil, like Nigeria, where the percentage right now is very low, but in the future, that is where most will happen. And here we see a statistics that roughly 60% of the world population is going to live in a hot and humid climate. And we have done a lot of research on how to protect buildings in winter, but we are not as advanced when we are thinking about hot and dry and hot and cold conditions. Moreover, we know that the warm is getting warmer but uh, most of the warming is happening in cold climate. We are not seeing the same level of warming in a tropical environment. So overall, this one has a, a smaller effect compared to the population growth and to what I'm going to talk in the next slide. 
The main reason we are going to see an increase of the adoption of air conditioning is connected to economical growth. Uh, we are uh, something around 7 billion people in the world and uh, six out of seven has access to electricity, a little bit more than that. And when people have a low income and they need cooling, air movement is the main solution that they use. But when their income goes from a few dollars per day to something around five to $10 per day, then there is a shift from using fan to using air conditioning systems. And given that the world is getting richer and a significant part of the world population is going from low income to middle low income, basically moving where roughly 3 billion people lives right now, that will cause an increase of the use of air conditioning. This is a problem that has been recognized globally and the International Energy Agency has done a uh, report on it and they call it the future of cooling. And I decide to call and to name my talk with the same title, even if the content will be very different. In order to face this cooling crunch, they propose that we should improve the energy performance of our products. And uh, basically, you're not allowed to sell air conditioners that are not very efficient. And another thing that they are trying to do is product labeling, meaning that when people go out and buy, they will have reliable information about the performance of those air conditioning. Um, and I think that these are very important things, uh, but I think that they missed something that was important. They relatively downplayed the role of building design, you know, the importance of keeping the sun out uh, and keeping the heat out through proper shading and insulation. And they also kind of downplayed the role of natural ventilation. And overall, they almost completely missed the role of air movement. And my talk today will focus on why uh, myself and my colleague at the Center for the Building Environment thinks that actually air movement could play a major role in keeping people comfortable in the future. But before going there, let's focus on why we are providing cooling. The Center for the Build Environment has been going around for now almost uh, uh, 23 years, uh, asking people what they think about the building that they occupy. We ask, uh, how satisfied are you with the lighting? How satisfied are you with the acoustics? How satisfied are you with your furnishing? How satisfied are you with the art on the wall? How satisfied are you with the thermal environment? How satisfied are you with the layout of your space? And we collect this data mainly in North America and mainly for commercial building, but we have also data from schools, hospital, multifamily housing, and we have done this survey in other parts of the world. A few years ago, we look back at this database, and now this database has something around 900 buildings and more than 19,000 answers. And uh, we found that uh, overall, only 68% of people are satisfied with the thermal environment, with their buildings. And if you look at this data here, this 68, uh, the first step is trying to answer the question, is this a lot or is this little? And in order to answer this question, we need to compare with other industry. If we look at, for example, if you are the CEO of a company that sells computer, should you be happy if 68% of the people are satisfied and I don't know, something around 30% are dissatisfied? And when we compare our industry with others, we find level of dissatisfaction that are much higher. This level of dissatisfaction are more in par with the type of service that the government sometimes offer where you don't have a kind of a strong incentive to make your client happy. And when we look at which are the highest source of dissatisfaction, these ones are connected to acoustics. That's the number one problem that we find in building. And we find that something around 40% of the people are dissatisfied with temperature. 
In the next slide, I will show the result for all the different questions we ask. And so you see that down here, we have sound privacy as a major one and noise level. In some cases, we have around 40 to 50% of the people that actively say that they are unhappy and only 30 to 40% that say that they are happy about the environment. Um, so very importantly, I'm very happy that uh, Lily is there. Uh, she has been an advocate of the importance to not only teach about uh, acoustics, but then trying to create space where the acoustics is improved. Over here, you see very low level of satisfaction with acoustics, with temperature, and with the air quality. We are doing a little bit better with lighting and with the ability to you know, personalize your own environment, with the ability to interact with people and with the overall cleanliness of the space. But clearly there is a lot of work for people that are interested in HVAC system and in general in technical system in buildings to provide a better service. Um, we have seen this result now for many decades, and we did not see a significant improvement in time. First of all, we tend to see in general a high level of dissatisfaction, and we didn't find clear trend. Uh, one trend that we found is that when people are close to a windows, they tend to be happier than when they are far from a windows. So if you can, try to design buildings where people can stay close to a windows. And most probably people are happier when they are close to a windows because they can see outside, they get natural light, and in some situation they have some control over the thermal environment if the windows can be open. Uh, we tend to see that people tend to be happier if they are in a private office compared to a shared space. Many buildings are now designed as open space with the low partition or no partition. And there we found a much higher level of dissatisfaction. Another trend that we found is that uh, female tend to be more dissatisfied with the environment that male. The graph that you see over here is a recent work that where we look both at our survey, but also we did an analysis of Twitter uh, and what people wrote on Twitter about the space that they occupied. We tried to see if people were complaining about the fact that it was too hot or too cold, and then we look if they were male or female. And the most important result is shown over here in this part in, in summer, where when we look at the number of people that are too hot, they are equally split between male and female. But when we look at too cold, we find that mainly female feel that they are overcooled. We do not know why that is happening. It may be due to the way that we design HVAC system. It may be connected to the way that we dress. It may be connected to the way people are uh, located in the space. It may be due to the fact that who control the thermostat. Overall, what we find is that uh, we have a large percentage of people that are dissatisfied with the thermal environment in summer because it's too cold. And if you pause for a second and think about it, that's kind of crazy. Thinking that we are wasting energy by overcooling building to, and we make people uncomfortable at the same time. And air movement, as I will describe later, is a kind of a good solution that allow to avoid this problem. Because there are several reasons why overcooling is happening. And some of these reasons are, are solid and good. Like, for example, the fact that we need to dehumidify the air in the space. A um, few years ago, people have thought, OK, we are not doing very well from the point of view of the you know, thermal environment, uh, air quality. And we are not doing very well from the point of view of uh, Acoustics, maybe if we certify the buildings with green certification, like the LEED certification, we are going to obtain better space. And other researchers have looked at the energy implication and found that overall there was some effect, but not, not very substantial. When we look at occupant satisfaction, 
we found basically no difference between lead certified and not lead certified. And this comparison was relatively large. We had more than 10,000 people in each group. And overall, regardless of what we look at that, we found that the satisfaction level was the same. Even when we look at you know, different certification level from certified to platinum, when we look at the specific point that people got, we didn't see an effect. And this doesn't mean that lead is not effective. It mainly means that we still don't know how to provide very good space. So what can we do? Uh, we are in a situation where we are familiar and we know that building uses a lot of energy. We also know that people are unhappy about it. And the technique that we use until now seems to not make a big difference. Uh, previous research at our center look at does radiant system provide better comfort? And we found the overall very little effect. Does the leader certification provide better comfort? Also in that case, we did not find a big effect. And so what can we do to improve comfort and hopefully reduce energy consumption? And that's what I'm going to focus today about. The first idea that we need to kind of internalize when we think about comfort and if we want to improve satisfaction of people, we need to move beyond the idea that temperature is the best descriptor of thermal comfort. Moreover, even more important, we need to understand that there is not one temperature that can satisfy everybody. We are different. We are physiologically different. We have different uh, expectation. We dress differently. Our activity is different in building. And therefore, we need different environment. There is not one temperature that can satisfy everybody. It's like assuming that there is one specific food or one specific size of shoes that can fit everybody. Unavoidably, if you push everyone to wear the same shoes, for some people will be okay, maybe for the majority of people will be okay, but for a large part of the population, or the shoes will be too big, or the shoe will be too small. Very similarly with the thermal environment. And so we need to provide personal control to people. And which is the best way to provide personal control? We can focus on heating and we can focus on cooling. And today I'm going to focus only on the cooling aspect. And the solution that we think is the most effective is to provide some level of fan and personal fan control. Why? Because fan are inexpensive. Fundamentally, it's some kind of copper in a motor and some blades. So technically, we can make them very inexpensively compared to an air conditioner the way you need a compressor, you need a fan, you need two heat exchanger, you have a refrigerant, is fundamentally a more expensive machine. Right now, air conditioners are often not much more expensive than fan because we are not producing fan at the same level of size and amounts. Moreover, fans use very little energy. And I hope that you don't think about the fan that right now you have at home, that fan most probably use an AC motor that is not very efficient. If that fan use a DC motor, it can move air with something around between two and 10 watts, very, very efficiently. One or two order of magnitude less than an air conditioner. And so when we started to notice this, we wonder why are we not seeing fan everywhere? They are inexpensive, they provide personal comfort, and they use less energy. And we realize that there are several reasons why fan are not in every buildings. Some of them are technical. And I will basically give you some updates about the work that we have done to try to solve this problem. The picture that you see here on the left was one of the most recent paper that we found when we started to look at fan something around 10 years ago. 
Basically, people stop doing research on this topic and thought, then is the past, the future is air conditioning, let's focus research on that. And then for many decades, this topic has been neglected. So there was not a lot of research on the, on the issue. And most of the work that we have done is to fulfill and update some of the gaps that were present on the technical aspect. There was also a lot of barrier from the regulation point of view. The standards that we developed were based with air conditioning in mind. ASHRAE has been built around air conditioning and therefore the standards kind of were in a way biased against their movement. We changed that in ASHRAE 55 and now we are working with other countries to change a similar situation in other parts of the world. Moreover, for many decades, there's been a lot of advertisement with air conditioning. And so there is the association that air conditioning is good and fan are old. And we have done some work, but not much to try to change that dimension. So now I will start to go a little bit deeper on what we have done in order to improve uh, the technical understanding of how fans works. One work was, uh, was during my PhD, we developed a model to assess the performance of a fan. Like when you buy an air conditioner, when you buy a refrigerator, when you buy a washing machine, and you have something that tell you the performance of the fan of, the, of that device, we try to develop something similar for fan, something that relate the service that that fan is giving you, we call this a cooling effect with the total amount of energy or power that that system is using. And so we developed this concept named cooling fan efficiency. And then we test many fans out there. Most recently, we test different type of motors. And that's what I was mentioning before. We found that the DC motors are much better than AC motors. So how can you distinguish if the fan use a DC or an AC motor. Very easy. If it's an AC motor, you have only three speed level. On the opposite, if you have four, five, six, eight, 20, or if you have a continuous control of the fan, then you know that that is a DC motor. Moreover, DC motor tend to be noiseless and they tend to cost more. So you can see a difference in the price of the fan. DC motors are way more energy efficient. Another big problem was that we didn't know how the air was moved inside the space. There was some study with one fan in one room and measuring a couple of points along one of the axes of the fan. And we realized that this was not sufficient. And so we built a system where we could measure the airspeed in hundreds of points in one room. And then we test the effect of one fan at different speed, but also we start to look at the interaction of fans. Fan, like lighting, tend to create a strong airspeed just below the fan. Like lighting, it provides a lot of light just below the light, but then it tends to disappear very quickly. And so we realized that we need to do more work on it. We develop a tool where people can download the data that we collected and use that data to calibrate CFD systems. What you see here on the right, those are not the CFD simulation. These ones are actual measurement of the airspeed. And when we did those type of measurement, we realized this phenomenon that you can see over here. A lot of air movement just below the fan and when you move outside, you basically do not have air. And that's one problem that we think is not yet solved. So if you are thinking about the PhD topic or MS topic, there is a lot of work to be done on this aspect of how can we create a more homogeneous airspeed in the space. When we start to have fan that interact, if we are not mistaken, this one was the first studies that look at the interaction between fans. And when they work together, we can remove or reduce that, that zone where you don't have enough airspeed. But when one fan is stronger than the other, basically overcome 
that fan. And therefore, you don't have a, almost an effect of that air movement. The air movement that is generating the space is affected by many parameters. It's affected by the size of the fan. It's affected by the distance between the fan and the ceiling, the blades and the floor. It's affected by the size of the room. And therefore, we realize that if we want to see fan in buildings, we need to have the standardized method to measure their performance. And we need to have that information available to designer. Like when you decide how many lights you need in a space, you need to know the lighting performance of that luminaire, the same we will need for fan. So we have been working with ASHRAE to develop a new method of test to determine how do we measure the performance of a fan and how do we report in a way that can be used by designer to decide, should I have one fan? Should I have four fan? Should I have eight fan in my space? Which is the effect of installing the fan at different height between the blades and the ceiling. For example, if the blades are too close to the ceiling, you're going to choke that fan, meaning the fan will not be able to bring back the air that is going to feed those blades. And so the distance between the blades and the ceiling is very important. But also the relatively distance between fan is important. When we developed that method, we started to test the different condition. And after sufficient amount of testing, we had enough data to build a very simple tool. And so we generate a tool. You can access the tool for free online. It's a very simple. You can learn how to use it maybe in a couple of hours. Uh, if you're not familiar with comfort or fan, it may take maybe one day. But at the end of that day, you will have some more fundamental uh, knowledge on how much air speed does a fan create, uh, which is the cooling effect that is creating that space. space. Uh, how uniform is the air speed? And then you will be able to do trade-off between different types of fan design. This tool works together with another tool that we developed, that is the CB thermal comfort tool that allowed people to input some of the thermal comfort information and assess which is the resulting thermal comfort condition. Right now, this is the official tool for Azure Standard 55. And in, when Azure will release the 2023 version of the standard, we will uh, update it with all the last addenda of the standard. This is the tool that mainly designers use or students use, but if you are a researcher, uh, this tool does not allow you to process a lot of data. And so we develop a Python thermal uh, comfort library that you can use for free, it's open source, all the code is open source, and most of the thermal comfort models that are, exist out there from the PMV, the adaptive, the standard equivalent temperature, and several heat stress index are available in this uh, library. The tool allowed you to compare spaces. And so here in this example, we have a room at 24 degrees C. That's something around, I would say, 70, I'm not very good in the IP, 76 maybe Fahrenheit with a space that is closer to 80, 82 degree Fahrenheit. And the two space can provide equal comfort if you provide air movement. So the tools allow you to calculate the cooling effect, how much that air movement is cooling you. And therefore you can increase the temperature set point in the space thanks to the presence of air movement. Um, here in this chart, we show uh, the air speed and the effect of air speed on this matrix, the cooling effect, how much you can increase the temperature set point uh, in the space thanks to the presence of air movement. And an important point 
is that most of the design is connected to relatively low airspeed. When we walk, our speed is something between 200 and 300 uh, feet per minute. But a typical design, oops, a typical design for ceiling fan, it's around 100 uh, feet per minute. So we are not talking about a, an amount of air movement that can move papers in the space. It's an amount of air movement that is able to break the thermal plume that exists around people. And if we look at the uh, typical condition in buildings, that's something around here, maybe 40 to 60 uh, feet per minute. So, and then we want to increase that to something around 100 in order to achieve uh, our goals. If you have personal control, then you can go to much higher level. But these levels are still less than the self-generated air movement that you create when you walk around. Uh, when we generate and we move uh, air, uh, we need to pay attention that we generate usually with ceiling fan high speed at the floor level. And in the past, uh, we look at the risk of overcooling people fit. And this one was a major problem when people use displacement ventilation or underfloor air distribution because you had air conditioned air deliver at high speed at the floor level. So we have done experiment about this and now we build a model that has been implemented now in the Asher standard 55 that allowed you to assess the effect of air movement at the floor, at the feet level. And we can cover also situation like you can see over here in this image when people do not uh, wear shoes or socks or long trousers. Overall, we don't see that this is a problem with fans. It's a problem with displacement ventilation. It's a problem with underfloor air distribution. But with fans, usually we are in a situation where our body is already all neutral or slightly warm, and therefore we should not worry. But if you want to do some calculation, this tool is available in the CB Comfort tool, and you can assess if that could be a risk or not. So until now, I told you, fan are very good, but are they really? So we started to test this in different environment. First, we went to a lab and we have done some human subject experiment. And this one are human subject experiment with something around 60 people. So it's not a small studies. And we started our experiment with the baseline temperature at 73 degree Fahrenheit. And in that case, we found that 85% of the people found the space acceptable. And keep in mind that acceptability and comfort are not always exactly the same. And then we increase the temperature set point of six degrees Fahrenheit from 73 to 79, and we gave them a fan that they can control. And we found 100% satisfaction level. And when we get rid of the fan, we found that the satisfaction level went down a little bit, but not too much, meaning that people were more satisfied when they were close to 79 than when they were at 73. And that's an indication is that many situations for many subjects, 73 degree Fahrenheit may be too cold. And so it's better to increase the temperature point to something around 79. And then if they feel warm, give them a fan. And if they are fine, then you don't need to uh, invest in that solution. We also tried to go at higher temperature. We went up to 84, and we found that with the fan, it was still OK. But when we test the same idea in real building, we found that it was too high. And that's what we did next. We went to a high-end office environment. This one was the office of a large corporation. Here we are located in Singapore. And we started with the building at the set point condition that they had naturally. It was something around 73 degree Fahrenheit. And we found that only 58% of the people were satisfied. When we increased the temperature to 79, we obtained two things at the same time. We increased substantially the amount of people that were happy, and we substantially reduced the energy consumption. Basically, fan 
it's a win-win situation. They save energy, and if you have some level of personal control of them, you also increase satisfaction. When we try to go to higher temperature, around 81, 82, 84, we started to see problem. Many people were not finding the environment sufficiently comfortable. One problem that is not yet solved about fan is flickering. And usually manufacturer of fan suggest that the fan should be installed far away from lighting, but that's very hard to do. Uh, not only because, you know, sometimes these two things are not installed at the same time, but uh, also sometimes you have angular effect, where even if the light is far from the blades, at specific angle, you still have some level of flickering. And these one are all images that we took in Singapore, where you can see that the light and the fan interact among themselves. And so we have done some experiment in the lab. And in one case, we used two rooms that were exactly the same. We create the same air movement. We create the same air quality. We create the same noise level. But the difference was that one used a fan that has opaque blade and the other one has transparent blade. And so you can see here that one create flickering and the other one did not create flickering. Then we tested human performance and satisfaction level. And overall, we found a small improvement with the transparent fan, but we realized that installing transparent fan may not be always the best solution because from a safety point of view, you don't see the blades and many people do not like to see transparent fan. So I give you some evidence that fan are good for people, but do the fan save energy? And how does fan save energy? The main way that fan save energy is through the increase of temperature set point. So if in summer you increase the temperature set point, you have something between seven to 15% HVAC energy saving for every degree C that you increase the temperature. Something similar happened also in heating. And among the different strategy that we explore to save energy, this is probably the most cost-effective. It's relatively easy to implement and it provides substantial energy saving right away. You don't need to you know, have expensive facade retrofit, changing the windows, installing shading device, improving the control of your AC, uh, changing the overhead light. Increasing the temperatures at point in summer, reducing them in winter, it's relatively simple. And then you need to think about device that you can provide to people to compensate for the different comfort. And today I talk about fan, but I could give an equal amount of information about heating and how personal heating system can provide this service. So we have done this work and this simulation work in Europe. Uh, I did that during my PhD. And then we repeat that in the United States and we also did it in Singapore. And the result has been often the same. Major energy saving if you increase the temperature set point. This one is work that we've done in Singapore. Similarly there, they don't have uh, heating. We see some major energy saving when we increase the temperature set point. And the amount of energy that you use to run the fan is almost negligible. So little that it doesn't make a difference in the system. And in some very simple simulation that we have done, we found that if we increase the temperature set point, we save so much energy that we could double the amount of air that we provide to people, for example, during a pandemic, without having an increase in energy consumption. All the work that I just showed in tonight's simulation, but we have also done some measurement in building. We have studied 13 air conditioned uh, buildings for almost three years. And in this case, we did something uh, very gentle. We did not tell people what to do. 
we just went there and say, oh, we are going to install FAM for you. And you do whatever you want with them. And what we notice is that when people have that option, they started to use it. And the FAN usually start on as the first device to protect people. And then only when the temperature was going above a certain threshold, for example, 80 degrees Fahrenheit, then the air conditioning would start. And we learned quite a lot about those experiments, those observations. Uh, one of them is that people do not want high airspeed, uh, small airspeed, and then people do not go to a very high temperature. We found that the average temperature was something around 25 degrees C. And at the same time, we found a major energy saving, much more than what we obtain through simulation. And we were surprised. So less higher temperature than what we expect in the experiment and more energy saving than what we uh, expect through the simulation. So we were very encouraged by this field test. Then can also be used for air quality. Uh, we have done experiment in our lab that when people are breathing, Part of the air that is exhaled, it's re inhaled by people. And therefore, if you measure CO2 in the space, that's very different from what people are inhaling. And we found that if you have a fan, you break that plume of polluted air and potentially you could provide better air. We are also doing an experiment on the effect of fan on the spread of airborne disease, and we found very exciting. Uh, results. Um, until now, I covered a lot of the technical aspect. Now I will go to some of the regulatory aspect. Overall, we found that the standards has been designed in the United States, in Europe, internationally, in Asia, against air movement. For example, this one is a quote from the European standard that is basically the same as the international standard. Under summer comfort condition, with indoor operative temperature above 25, you can use air, but only if it's personally controlled. And we think that this is a perfect example of unfairness. Why do we need to treat air differently from temperature? It's one of the way, many ways that we can control the thermal environment. We are not saying, oh, only if you have direct control of the thermostat, then you can change the air temperature or the humidity. And so we were able to remove this bias in the ASHA standard 55, and we are trying to do the same also with other mm -hmm. standards. One thing that is often coming up is the following graph. This graph was developed a few years ago by colleagues at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, plus a, a well-known building scientist, Oli Sapinen from Finland. They did a literature review and they put together different type of studies. And they found that if you keep the temperature 72 degree, you will have the highest performance. And every time that you move from that perfect temperature, your productivity will be reduced. Um, this model has been also implemented now in the handbook of fundamental with the graph over here that say, if you are in thermal neutrality, you have the highest performance. And if you move out, you will be less productive. And this is a big deal because if you go from 72 to 77, you will have, according to the standards, a reduction of performance of 2.5%, meaning that for a typical employee, this could be a loss of $5,000 per year. And many people that try to increase the temperature set point or reduce the temperature set point in building came back to us and say, we cannot do it because people will be less productive. We look at the data and we say, mm, that doesn't sound very accurate. First of all, because we are aware that, yes, there are some models that assume that there is only one condition where you are in peak performance, 
But there are other models, we call this the extended U model, where you can change your stress condition, in this case, temperature, it could be air quality, it could be many other things like lighting level, and your performance will not be affected. Only when it's very, very hot and very, very cold, you will see an effect. And so we started to look at the data and it was hard because the data were not open source. And uh, we have basically to reconstruct that database. And uh, we took all the previous data, we re-put them together and we calculate how accurate is this model. And this model has an R square of 0.05, very low, meaning that 95% of the variance was not explained by temperature. And the uncertainty was higher than the phenomena that we wanted to capture. And basically we concluded that this model was no different from a model that assumed that there was no relationship between temperature and performance. And therefore this model should not be used. When we found this result, we knew that they were very controversial. And uh, therefore we decided to do several steps to make our result as solid as possible. We made our database open source. We collected more data because that was done several years ago. And so we were able to expand the database. Now we have 35 studies going from the 1950 to 2020 almost. We have much more database and the, the previous work only look at a quadratic model. We started to look at different type of model, regression model, linear model, quadratic, cubic. We started to test many different type of machine learning algorithm. We tested also this expanded um, uh, model of performance. And here, and we tested something more than 20 models. And the takeaway, point is that all of these models have a prediction accuracy that is so low that is not different from assuming that there is not an effect of temperature on performance. This does not mean that the thermal environment does not affect performance. It's very much possible that if you are at 90 degrees Fahrenheit or if you are at 20 degrees Fahrenheit, people will be affected by those thermal conditions. It's also possible, hypothetically, that in more reasonable conditions, the typical value that you find in building, there may be an effect. But we don't have right now the data to claim that there is one temperature that is better than the other. And so we concluded that when aggregating the data from different studies, we were not able to find the relationship between temperature and work performance. We knew that many people were going to be very dissatisfied with this result. And so we shared our database, we shared our code, and we also built an online tool where people could go there and slice the data as they prefer, looking at different type of cognitive model, looking at different type of regression, looking at different dimension of performance, both speed and accuracy, looking data from different parts of the world, and we show the result for them. Overall, what we found is with existing data, we cannot. And now we are working with ASHRAE to remove that model from the handbook of fundamentals. Another work that we are doing right now is working with the World Health Organization, CDC, and other agency. Because according to this agency, you cannot use air movement when the temperature is above 35 degrees C. 35 degrees C is some kind of proxy for the average skin temperature. And the idea there is if the temperature is higher than 35, the air will be warmer than your skin temperature. Therefore, if you move the air, you will warm up your body. We know from a physiological point of view that this doesn't make too much sense because the main mechanism that is used to cool down people when it's hot is evaporation. And if you increase the air movement, you increase evaporation. And so through the use of a 
modeling technique, the standard equivalent temperature, we were able to show that fan can be used in a much wider range. Here you see that it's around 35, but we show that depending on the condition, it can be 43, 44 degrees. And in order to allow people to test if in their specific situation, fan can be used, we develop an online tool where basically the system tell you, yes, you're in comfort or not, you're not in comfort. Or are you in heat stress or not in heat stress? This model is based on simulation. And now we have colleagues that are physiologists that are testing this in real climatic chamber to see if we can very solidly say that fan can be used and therefore being able to change the recommendation of the World Health Organization. So we have been working on technological aspect. We've been working on regulation, but probably the difficult part is going to work on the cultural aspect. This one is a screenshot of an advertisement from many decades ago, where the idea was that if you have an air conditioner, you will be happy at home. And that type of work will take time to counteract. But we start to see a lot of example of fan use. This one is the headquarter of a large construction company, DPR in Phoenix, and they use natural light with this sort of tube. They provide dedicated outdoor air system in the space, and then they use ceiling fan to cool people in the summer. Uh, one project that I like particularly is this one in the Bay Area, where this one was a low cost retrofit of a building. This one should, is a spec building, so the cost is the most important aspect. And they were able to uh, do this and provide fan in a cost-effective way, and they could get rid of air conditioning. We are in a mild climate, and fan alone can provide comfort. In many, many situations, you need to have fan that work with air conditioning in order to provide comfort. We see here what claimed to be the most sustainable building in the United States, the Bullet Center. They use fan to provide the comfort in summer. And recently the RMI, uh, the Rocky Mountain Institute buildings also use the ceiling fan in their space. We see a lot of use of ceiling fan in semi-outdoor space. This one is in Singapore. It's again, one of the most sustainable building and construction in Singapore. And the idea is that when you are outside and it's hot, air movement is among the most cost effective together with shading to provide people in comfort. And one of the projects I'm most excited about was not done by us. This one is the new school of architecture in Singapore at the National University of Singapore, where they have this ceiling fan and the space are kept at a very high temperature and they obtain a zero energy building that use very little air conditioning. We started to see also an innovation in the type of product that are out there. Many people do not like to see fan spinning and blades spinning. And so we start to see solution where the blades are hidden and therefore it tend to be easier. Here we have two example installed here in the United States. And we started to see example of desk fan. These one are different type of products. Some of them are very inexpensive. You can find them for five, 10, $20. And of course, we also have the much more expensive solution like the Dyson one, where the blades are hidden and there where sometimes they provide also some form of air cleaning. But in particular, the fan that we see over here on the right, or this one over here on the left, this one use few watts. They cost few dollars, and they give you something that is available right now in the market and can be used for providing comfort. With this type of solution, you can increase the temperature point in the space, stop having the problem of overcooling, and if someone is too hot, giving them a fan and provide comfort. We are testing this idea in many buildings in Singapore. And 
in some of them, we completely retrofit the space. We went there, we removed the existing system and we installed both ceiling fan and desk fan. We provide a sensor at each desk. This one is more kind of a living lab. And now we are studying the, you know, is it better to use ceiling fan or is it better to use desk fan? But also in other buildings, we are just getting in the existing space and say, I increase the temperature point and I give you a desk fan. And then we are looking at how people are doing. We are still running through the result and running through the experiment, but I can tell you that we are finding that providing fan to people could be among the most cost-effective way to increase at the same time satisfaction of people and reduce the energy consumption of building. Thank you very much. Thank you, President. We, you might not have heard us clap because I only just unmuted us a moment ago. <laughs> and um, we do have some time for questions, and I'm just reposting your chat, uh, which shows the links to the slides and everything. But questions? We are now live. Stefano, um, yes. I had the fortunate experience before I built my recent house, suspending a a, a summer in uh, Pakistan. Yeah. And what they did there is they had the high ceilings with the fans, well well ventilated applications, uh, in which I copied in the house that I built. And um, it's a lead platinum house. But mm -hmm. you know, as far as what they also did well, from a noise standpoint, they had a lot of different homes had inner courtyards. So oh, yeah. they were able to vent well and also have, you know, you mentioned that with the, um, the acoustics and the sound problems that that was the biggest issue, obviously, when we're ventilating that. Is that popular? Have you found, you know, um, in other areas besides like, you know, in, in that part of the world was it, is where they've got the using the courtyards then to kind of reduce Reduce the uh, negative effects of having the open windows with the ventilation and that. Um, overall, I think that we are starting to go towards a much more standardized building environment. And, and so residential building start, are going to be less different than they were in the past. Mm -hmm. And we start to see lower ceiling and uh, less use of this courtyard. Okay. And so in that condition, we are losing the benefit of, uh, of those type of solutions. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, uh, uh, people are used to air movement uh, and they are familiar with the technology in their residential building. So we don't see a lot of problem in the penetration of this solution there. They can right away see that they cost much less. So the key is buy a good fan. Right now, the large majority of the fan that you can buy are not very good. They are AC, the blades are not designed by engineers and therefore they don't move air very well. Sometimes they are installed too close to the ceiling and therefore they choke and they don't provide enough air. Uh, our yes. efforts is to try to bring this into commercial building, into schools, into university, yeah. into semi outdoor space. Yes. And you've seen, you know, obviously the what they call the big ass fans. Yeah. Are those as far as uh, the fan on the market that's you feel uh, highly rated? Does that seem to work good for your air movement? I know some they're so large, they got low speed, and they, you know, the volume of air they move is really significant. Is that uh, is there a better one out there that you're you're looking at as far as when you look at a ceiling fan application? Uh, in general, the larger the fan, the better, uh, for several reasons. First of all, they tend to be engineered. So you have, uh, and biggest fan is one producer, but there are other producer, Hunter, and others uh, that produce yeah. large fan. These large fan tend to be better design. They have a better motor design. They have a better blades design. Second, when they are large, they tend to move more air, Right. And you remember that I showed you that the air is very high below the fan and then it tends to disappear. 
with one exception, that the, the air change direction and move horizontally along the floor. Yes. And if you have a large fan, mm -hmm. then you can wash out people much better. The main problem, so if you can install a large fan, but there are limitations. They only fit in certain room size and you need a significant amount of head height between the floor and the blades. And that is the main reason why you don't see them much is because the distance between the floor and the ceiling is reduced. And if right. you don't have enough space, you cannot install them for safety reason. I have the uh, largest fan in my stairwell and at the top of the stairwell, I have a remote a window ventilation. So I'm able to go and, and adjust that. And that seems to work well. Thank you for the information. Appreciate it. You're welcome. We have one question in 160 that we'll go ahead and take. Yes, go ahead, Dr. Uh, hi, uh, let's jump in again. So uh, first, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, it's a very interesting topic. I totally agree with you that and there's a lot of time, there's no need to overcool the building, but it's just a fan can solve a lot of problem. Uh, but I'm, I am curious about uh, a few things uh, with fan. So uh, first, uh, like, um, have you observed any relationship between the duration of the fan operation on people's uh, comfort? Um, because, uh, so I actually, as I grew up, I also uh, use fan a lot. So I, what I did often is like, I put the fan on and off intermittently because I know like, uh, you know, if I, uh, when I just uh, turn on the fan, uh, you know, I feel like the improvement in comfort is quite, significant and but maybe uh, over uh, the longer term maybe in a few hours um, that can potentially give me some problems so then i turn it off and on like do you observe like there's a general um, trend in like how this affect people so <coughs> yes and uh, um, fan can exacerbate problems for example if you have pollen in the air or if the air is polluted, you're basically blasting more pollen or more uh, particles against people's face. And uh, we know that there is a part of the population that find that irritating, and for them, then can create a problem, particularly at the eye, the nose, and the mouth. Uh, some people found that the problem tend to not be as strong if instead of orienting the fan towards the face, you orient the fan towards other body parts, like the chest or the feet. In general, we found that there is a, a percentage of the population that do not like the fan. They don't like the frequency of the air, or they don't like the perception of air movement. And the best way is to not provide that solution to people. But this doesn't mean that air conditioning do not have equal <laughs> problem. There are people that find that air conditioning is creating problem in their muscles, in their neck, or make their mucose dry, like their mouth and their eyes. And so in time, I realized that we need to try to provide to people what people like and giving them option to choose from, someone will really do not like the use of air conditioning, they don't want it, other people may not want the use of fan, and therefore, again, giving personal choice may be the best solution to satisfy the, the largest possible amount of people. Thank you. Yeah, I just uh, think like uh, maybe, uh, maybe just as an idea, I have maybe like some research, uh, like in collaboration with uh, like medical researchers on like. Um, to see, uh, to investigate the uh, effect of the fun on the health of like general uh, population. So like having, maybe having this kind of results would uh, uh, be something that is helpful uh, if we want to like push the uh, application of fun in the design yeah. standards for, um, we want to let like more building adopt to it. But something to keep in mind uh, that is uh, both a blessing and a curse of fun is that there are right now, I think if I remember the number correctly, more than 2 billion fan in operation in this moment. So it's not a new technology. People have been using fan for hundreds 
uh, year now, uh, electric fan. And so it's not a new technology that we need to study potential health effects that are unexpected. You know, if we are talking about uh, 222 nanometer far UVC light, this is new. We have relatively little knowledge and we need to study heavily before spreading them out. On the opposite, we have hundreds, actually millions of fans that are used in operation in the United States in summer. And so we expect, we know already quite a lot of them. You know, some serious fact, effect, you know, people or kids that you know, put their hand on the blades and get harmed by that, or a situation where you throw the ball and the ball jump off the fan, or issue of flickering. These one are, 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 we feel confident about fan because they are already quite common in buildings. There are at least three more questions, but I also feel badly because we said this would end at 1.15. So perhaps we will go ahead and give Dr. Schiavo one more round of applause and those who would like to stay and ask you. Thank you very much. I will be happy to stay. Nice to meet you. Thank you, you so much. If um, some people want to leave, but I know there are some people who maybe want to stay for some more questions. We'll like, take a second and let them um... So I see that the Fatih has a question. Yes. Yeah, how uh, uh, Fatih, uh, PhD candidate from University of Minnesota. Uh, my question is actually, uh, are you working on uh, coupling this uh, fan, ceiling fan or any other fan systems with radiant heating or cooling? Because uh, there is a huge trend, you know, uh, huge transition to radiant heating and cooling. So uh, I was just wondering uh, when you couple these two together, uh, what are the results? So the two works very well together because one of the problem of radiant cooling it's its limited capacity. It is only able to remove a certain amount of cooling load. If you move the air, and we have done experiment with radiant ceiling with the fan behind the radiant panels or with the fan below. So we put muffled fan <laughs> behind the panels but also we have a ceiling fan that was blowing around. And we also look at the condition where you have a radiant floor and cooling with fan. In all these three situations, the convective coefficient increase. And so you increase your cooling capacity. And if you send me an email, I will send you the work where we showed an increase of something between um, five to 25% of the cooling capacity thanks to the presence of air movement. Air movement is hidden or air movement that is visible in the space. I would say that right now there is a need to do research on it. So if you are planning any radiant cooling experiment, I encourage you to put some fan and calculate and measure the convective coefficient because right now we need to have more work to have some kind of relationship between the convective coefficients and the airspeed provide my fan. And I will be happy to put you in contact with our team that is looking at this aspect. Okay, thank you very much. Dow, do you want to go next? Yeah. Since Dr. Liu already talked about a little bit on health, so I'm uh, just interested to know what could be the impact of fans on uh, inside, for, inside any building for the occupants from a health and wellness perspective, since you already talked about a little bit on lead and how they can help in uh, overall global energy reduction. So since we have more concepts built around wellness, like the well AP thing. And so how do you think uh, they would affect the wellness or indoor air quality or infection? And are you ref is the question about fan or in general? About fan, what would be the yeah. impact of having just fans or yeah? Or so um, the answer is complex, but let's try to divide it. First, on thermal environment, <laughs> given that you give personal com comfort, I would expect that I would see an increase in well-being and therefore hypothetically health. 
And if you are in a heat stress condition, they can save your life by using FEN. Um, there is, a, as I mentioned before, a subset of the population that would find FEN uncomfortable, in particularly when, for example, you may have pollutants in the air. This pollutant can be ozone, it could be particle, it could be pollen. In all of these cases, you increase the amount of these pollutants hitting your face or your body, and therefore you may have a negative impact. What could be the largest effect is connected to the issue of mixing. One problem that we have in building is that you may have short circuiting of air, or you may have a situation where you have a high pollutant and low pollutant, and space are not well mixed. Then help to create a well mixed condition so you are more confident that you do not have area of your space of the building that have high concentration of pollutants, where exposure can be you know, one order of magnitude higher than in another part of the buildings. A big question mark now is about the role of air movement for the transmission of disease. And uh, um, we are not yet sure. I think more studies will need to be coming out. Uh, but for now, some preliminary work show that air movement can be even better than filtration and dilution in the reduction of short range transmission of viruses, basically because you dilute and push out the virus better. Uh, I think that before coming to a solid conclusion about this, uh, we will need to take several years of research. Dr. Okay. Dr. Santos had a question. Yeah, so uh, first of all, thanks for the presentation. It was super interesting, even if well, this is not my field, but uh, I found it very interesting. So I am a big advocate of uh, integrated smart operation in buildings. I think this, this is an essential link to achieve comfort and well-being. So part of this requires us to have a good uh, reliable feedback at any time step, right? And when we introduce a fan where the wind velocity becomes a very significant part of what's going on there, do you see this as a factor that could uh, not help in the massive implementation of this technology for controls and buildings? Yeah, it, it is. And uh, um, the lack of homogeneity of the air movement field is a major problem. I didn't spend too much time today on it, but think that, you know, 100 years ago, when we started to think about electrical lighting and you shine light and it was well bright below the light and then it was dark all around. And then in time, we start to think about luminary, about how to spread the light better. And now we have a lot of tool that we know that in a certain space, we cannot have just one light and cover the entire space. We need to create a certain level of homogeneity. And with light, it's very simple because it can be easily perceived by people. So if you have a spotty light, you realize right away. We don't have that with air movement. Moreover, air movement, it's very directional, different from light where you can go around with it an illuminance meter and more or less get a sense of how well is your system performing. So we are far behind in that aspect. And there, I, in that area, I expect there could be the highest amount of innovation and research, creating a kind of a similar to light, similar to fire, a more distributed system, a system that is better integrated in the ceiling and a system that can provide a more homogeneous and ideally a way to measure airspeed. Because right now, hot wire and moment are too expensive. They are not wireless. And there are some solutions like this Doppler and a moment that we developed, but they are bulky. They're not yet common in the market. And so we basically fly blind with their movement because we don't have a good way to measure airspeed. Another PhD topic. Yeah. Other questions? 
from any of our online. Yes, Dr. Lau, Josephine. Yeah, yeah, I have a question. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for giving this all your excellent work. I am so inspired. <laughs> now I want to talk more with you. I actually have two companies reach out to me in the past, both are ceiling fan related. So that's why you, you with your presentation that come back to my memory. One is actually they in, include a filtration system inside the filter, uh, inside the ceiling fan. So they yeah. are pushing the air through. When it's pushing the air through, it's also push through filter. Have yeah. you heard of it? Have you looked into it? And there is also another company they also try to install um, the UV LED light into, yeah. yep, into the ceiling fan. So these are like a combined, try to take advantage of your ceiling fan, but adding filtration or air cleaning features. What is your point? What is your view on those products? So um, let's think about first uh, Dyson. Uh, so Dyson is a company that uh, have done two things. First of all, they make the plates disappear. Uh, the blades uh, are transforming in a uh, turbine from an axial fan to a centrifugal one. And then they have a filtration system. When you do these two things, you tend to create uh, a couple of problems. The first is that you have much higher pressure drop and you tend to create noise because when you change the direction of air or when you push air through something that they want, doesn't want to go through, you increase noise. And if you increase noise, you create a major problem. People do not use the bathroom fan or the kitchen hood fan or portable air cleaner mainly for noise. So if uh, to clean the air you create noise, you are failing because people then will not use it. So that's point number one. Uh, point number two is that Dyson doesn't move a lot of air. And that's why their CADR is relatively low compared to other portable air cleaner. And so the, the, the advantage of an axial fan is that it moves a lot of air with little energy. And so the, there could be another trade-off there. The problem seems not to be there if you shine UV light because it doesn't create a pressure drop and the fan move a lot of air. And so you get the benefit of having a lot of air. So I see there is potential. I know there are companies that are already selling product with UV light embedded in, in it. Um, and I do not know, I should ask you about how effective is the residence time sufficient? Are the light source strong enough? What, what do you think about the effectiveness of that solution? Yeah, because this is actually one of the projects that I am working on. We is a residential home. The company reached out to us, Big, Big S Fan. I don't mind telling yeah. you the name. Yeah. <laughs> Big S Fan. They uh, try to integrate UV light with the fan that they are they are designing. So uh, yeah, we want to test it out. Yeah, so we have a house that is designed for um, uh, elderly senior retirement mm -hmm. home. So, uh, so we will find out how effective it is. And I'm also contemplating what is the right, uh, proper wavelength. Should it be 222 or should it be 254? Yeah, because I have uh, yeah, interest in both. Yeah, so that is something I think I, I want to explore. Yeah, so maybe something new new that I, I see the potential because yeah. I definitely see um, maybe the living room area, the common gathering place. That's the place that, maybe infection will occur the most if we can have some ceiling fan bring comfort and at the same time bring protection in terms of tra airborne transmission i think why not yeah so i think i can yeah. see that potential yeah something that will be important is to disentangle the effect of air movement from the effect of uv so compare just air movement and air movement plus uv because it could be of interest to understand, is the air movement that make the biggest difference or is it UV that make the biggest difference? Hmm. But the light can turn on and off. So I can do some experiment on fan only and then uh, fan <clears throat> with light. So right. I can see the, the, the difference from that, yeah. yeah. I, um, this uh, area of uh, 
disinfection, it's clearly important. And so we need to continue to push on. And I'm happy to see that more and more people are working on this important aspect. Yeah. Any other questions today from the Zoom, from the room? Pete has a question. I got an email two minutes ago from a big ass fan, so I think they're listening to us. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> maybe no. they were. I, mean, I definitely did post it on LinkedIn yesterday, so maybe. <laughs> All right, well, let's give up. Dr. Skip, one more round. Thank you very much. If you don't mind, I was just about to send you a message. If you don't mind staying on, you can maybe mute your video, and but I'll we'll, we'll uh, I'll just want to reconnect with you before we before we stop. So. Yes. <laughs> All right, Thanks, everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Did you perform any uh, research on the effect of fan with air, with uh, heating instead of AC and the effect that it has on on the the environment, the work environment? I'm not sure he looked at that. He may be muted right now. Can you can you type that question for him? Oh yes. Um, or your question. Have you just tested the effect of fans with heating? Heating rather than cooling. I wonder if he sees that. <laughs> it's a question of mixing, right? It's just, it's just air mixing better in the room. So, I mean, like, does it? Uh, can yes. Be... Uh, I can answer if you want. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, of course, you don't want to use a uh, uh, fan in heating too much because the fan is cooling you, it's increasing your convective capacity. It's used mainly to mix, uh, destratify the space if you have a stratification. And so we uh, look at fan in heating for two main reasons. One is that when we get rid of the ducts and the diffuse in a building, we still need to distribute the air. And so we spin the fan by pushing the air up instead of by pushing the air down. And by having the fan spinning very slowly, you can create this mixing and that's more energy efficient than by pushing the warm air into the space with diffuser. And that's the extent that we look at that. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you, Otto. Thanks, Zina.